Hello and welcome back to Jodra for Stargazing Live, Back to Earth, an extra half hour of astronomically good conversation. We'll try and answer more of your questions about Mars, the search for life and water in our galaxy and anything else under the skies that you want to know about. So send in your questions, your emails to stargazing at bbc.co.uk. I'm going to introduce our panel. We have Dr. Lewis. Dar excuse me, Dartnell. I keep calling you to Parnell, I know, sorry, it's an Irish thing. Dr. Lewis Dartnell, obviously, is here, it's still here, thank you very much. Lucy Green, pleasure to have you here, Dr. Lucy Green. Professor Brian Cox, uh, as ever. Dr. Brian May, uh, and to give you your full title, David Badil. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <That's pretty laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. uh, David, thank you for, for joining us. Um, you have Pleasure. a science background. Mm, well, my dad was a yes. scientist. He was a research uh, biochemist in the early part of his career, and science was a big deal in our house, and he did, used to do this thing whereby he had a pack of periodic table cards, and each card had a different element on it, yep. and it was like element top trumps, essentially. And he would do this thing whereby he'd read out each one, say lead or whatever, to himself, and we, me and my brothers, would have to say uh, LB, uh, PB or how many electrons went around it, whatever. And if we got it wrong, he would beat us to a pulp. Oh, uh, as, uh, harsh, that's why it? I'm not a scientist. Oh, really? So yeah. if I were to just occasionally just randomly gra grab ones here, like TH? TH, uh, that's the symbol for the. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, thorium AC? AC, that would be uh, as in DC. <laughs> yeah. right. A queen, a queen go, go, bird, no, that. Oh, I'm going to go to the easy ones. I'll go to the yeah, easy yeah, ones. I will get them out of the hole by going the easy ones towards the end. It's a silly old thing. We've, we've got H at the end. He'll get that. Uh, yeah. uh, so, MO? How dare you? Uh, uh, NB. No, that means no to Bene, doesn't it? Now, ask me, ask me like one about. Home. AR, AR. AR, is that gold? No, no, it's Argon. Uh, uh, it's CL. <laughs> CL start. Yeah. Are you going to beat me to a pulp? Uh, sound it out. Sound it out. Uh, CL. CL. Uh, one of the Chlorine. 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 Very, very good. It, good to know very it wasn't wasted on you. Yeah. Um, well, it was, wasn't it? It was a complete disaster. A complete yeah, it was. Yeah. I mean, it might just be a very bad educational device to see your child <laughs> down and make him do top trumps yeah. on a periodic table. <laughs> the, uh, I'm going to give you booze instead, by the way. I'm going to give you a drink. This is a cocktail known as the Moonwalk. It was invented in 1969 by... Oh, Michael Jackson? Uh, no, by Joe Gilmore, a barman in the Savoy. The, uh, and it was in honour of Neil Armstrong. And Neil Armstrong drank it, actually, and said it was delicious. Sent him a letter. Uh, so, in tribute to him, I'm this and he's a barma, not me. Uh, what's, the, so, what's the ingredients? What's the ingredients? That's an, a superb question. Mm. The, um, let me just pour it. He hasn't got the right card in front of him. Grapefruit, no Grand Marnier, rose water, and champagne uh, are the ingredients of that. Rose water, yes. Well, very, very good, yeah. And what's, what's moonwalky about it? Just that Neil oh, Armstrong... Still at the time. Come on, he's a cocktail guy. Why do you think there was going to be anything particularly... Just, just enjoy the drink. The, uh, by the way... <laughs> how much more do we justify it? <laughs> the few television shows that get, give drink to people live on yeah, air. That's you're right. Uh, although, obviously, yes, guys. <laughs> responsibly. Um, the, we left various questions. How many questions did we leave hanging at the end of that? Most of them. Yeah. Like, is there life on Mars? Yeah. That was probably um, the big one. Uh, we touched on this idea. I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into this idea that there could have been a separate origin if we find life on Mars or a common origin. Now that's surprising I think to many people. You think well how could it have been? It, let's say life began on Mars. How did it get to Earth? Well you can, it seems quite likely that you can transfer life between inner planets in the same solar system um, because during the earliest era of the, of the solar system's history called the late heavy bombardment there's all this rubble left flying through space after the building the planets and smashing down onto the rocky worlds and throwing up, you know, bits and pieces, splinters off the worlds. So if there was life got started by that point and there's bacteria inside those rocks, they got blasted off. You could then transfer life from one planet to the next, a neighbouring planet, aboard these. And you could survive the journey because yeah. that surprises. So we, back, we can do tests in, in, in laboratories and, and look at the kind of conditions that you'd have to survive, and you seem quite likely to, to be able to survive it. And in fact, we've got pieces of Mars. I've held a piece of another world in my hand from one of these Martian meteorites that have, have made the journey to us. Um, That's the reason we would have made the reverse journey. Was there an experiment Earth. done? Was it on the space station where it left some bugs out? What yeah, was it, Lucy? Like, so you, yeah. you, you can put your samples on the outside of the space station, and then they're exposed to all the radiation, the charge particles and you can see if they survive. You bring them in and they're fine. That's right, and they test them. So <laughs> and how, how small are we talking about? You don't like tape a gerbil to the outside of the rock. <laughs> well, yeah. if you've got enough mass, maybe. You know, yeah. what, kind of things, what kind of things do they put outside? Mostly bacteria. And it turns out bacteria are pretty good surviving those kind of conditions. It's not really the cold and the vacuum that kills them, it's the radiation that kind of builds up over long periods. I read but somewhere that Viking, which was the previous one, the field curiosity and opportunity, mm -hmm. that some of the tests that it was doing to search for life might have killed life. 
apparently, which would have been <laughs> We quite tend to bad. bake the samples to drive off the volatiles and that, that's not good for life. But we look for the kind of signs that life wasn't there in the first place. <laughs> so the first thing, right. There must have been some reason for that. Let's, let's put it in an oven first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cook it that's right. If you give it some sugar, some food, and then you heat it, and then you can try and get that... There's no danger. It's a serious question, though. Can I ask you? I mean, I, yes. to ask, I met this guy in the car, <laughs> and I resisted asking him, but I want to ask him on the air. Do you think that it's one event we're talking about which produced life, and could it happen in another solar system. Well, the really, really interesting thing is that all life on Earth that we've come across and tested and looked at the DNA, we're all related. We're all cousins mm. of each other. You can draw this great big tree of life on Earth, and there's a single origin, a single mother it's of life. Wow. Luca. Mm. Luca, the last universal common ancestor. But that doesn't mean there was only one origin. There could have been several origins, and we just happened to be the only survivors that mm. outcompeted or probably, you know, ate. Mm. Ate the other life forms, but so if, if it got started once on life, it probably got started more than once on Earth, and you maybe think therefore so? Mars as well. So it could have happened spontaneously in another solar system, not just another planet in our solar. System. This is what I think is fascinating. It seems to me that the, the, the feeling now in the in the community is that given the right conditions, so given water, given some kind of temperature gradient, so the, the, the right minerals in the yeah. rock, then life, the origin of simple life, may be inevitable if the conditions are right. <laughs> it's, it's Would you say the that questions that people will come to? But it may not. Yes. Yeah. Over that. It's, it's either yeah. very close to zero or, or very close to one, we don't really know. And that's why Mars is so important, because it's happened twice in the same solar system on neighbouring planets, but it's still independent, that we're not one or the other. Yeah. Got I, I would them. think it, it depends whether you talk to a biologist or an astronomer, <laughs> whether it's a kind of yeah. science game or a numbers game, because as an astronomer, you look out into the universe and you see 100 billion lots stars in our there, galaxy, yeah. lots well, of galaxies beyond and, and that. And today, this is actually, there are 17 billion Earth-like planets in the Milky Way galaxy alone, is the new estimate yeah, from, from the Kepler data. Obviously, I haven't seen 17 million, but statistically, that's what it looks like. Mm. That's a lot, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so even if there's a small percentage chance... The but the, you're you're playing the Drake equation game, aren't you? <laughs> yes. You know, like, if, if there's enough planets then it, there must be a, a life somewhere else but not necessarily if the I, probability is that low right? sorry something and I'm, uh, you know I'm by far the the, the least in, in, you know educated about this uh, person here but there's something which occurred to me uh, when I was talking to Tim earlier the guy who runs this place which is he was talking about water vapor being picked up from all over the galaxy and obviously our first instinct is to search for life on other planets but is it not plausible that within water vapor itself within clouds of water vapor if water is the building block for life there might be microbes of one sort or another yeah can they survive an, an intergalactic journey? Yeah. Well, I think they could, and, and what you raise is something that's talked about on the planet Venus, where the, con mm. the conditions are hundreds of degrees on the surface of the planet, but up in the clouds, mm. it's kind of tantalising sense that the, the temperatures might be cool enough and, and liquid water droplets yeah. are there. Cloud-based life in Venus mm. rather than surface life. And then maybe on right. comets, as well as vast reservoir of comets in the Oort cloud. But you need more than just water, you need an energy source, and this is where mm. things like comets fall down, that it's mostly frozen, even if you have liquid water deep within a the comet, there's no flux, and there's no flow of things through it, there's no yes. warm sunlight to, to power things like plants. Could it be um, preserved, though, within the... The, the comet, which is what Fred Hoyle said, yes, wasn't he? Yes. Panspermia is. Do, do you give that theory credence that it could have all life could have come from? What word you just said? Panspermia. They okay, call it. It's the theory that, 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 <laughs> that is the Fred Hoyle's theory that yes. all life comes from from a comet, and spreading the seeds of life. But, yeah, but if, really? if, yeah. we found, if we found life on Mars and it was of a DNA structure, would that not give panspermia a certain? Well, there's kind of different flavors of panspermia. And the one we were talking about just earlier about uh, rocks being blasted off planets and transferred to other planets. That seems likely, in fact. We, we know it happens because we've got mm. rocks on Mars. But how could you get a cell into a comet? It is very different. Could comets panspermia form ever turn into pans people? Mm. That's really the question we're asking. That's a great fear. Yeah. I'm uh, going to move over to Mark, here. by the way. Mark has been collating <laughs> photographs that have been sent in over the course of the show. Mark, thank you for doing sterling work. And to the rest of you out in the field, where I'm sure it was incredibly comfortable uh, and pleasant to be here this <laughs> cruel January night. What photos have come in? We have got some stunning pictures, just like last year. You surpassed yourself. There's some great images coming in. The first one's actually especially for Brian Mayer. It's a picture of the zodiacal light that was taken by Graham Greene. Wasn't he uh, Robin Hood in years gone by? Wasn't he Graham yeah, Greene, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm sure it's probably a different one. But this is the zodiacal light, and that's the reflected sunlight off the uh, dust particles in the solar system. Very nice which will just pop there. We've got another stunning picture of Jupiter, which we've uh, seen a few times tonight, and it shows nicely the belts in the atmosphere, the red spot as well, of course, which you can see quite clearly, and also a couple of moons. I think that's Callisto there, and that's uh, Ganymede. So that's another stunning picture taken by Alan Murta. And then finally, something a little bit, little bit more extragalactic is an exploded star, which is a supernova explosion, taken by Dave Moulton, it's called the Jellyfish Nebula, and I think it was something like five hours of exposure time. So keep the pictures coming in. If you want to send pictures to our Flickr group, there's details on our website, www.bbc.co.uk forward slash stargazing. 
And back to you guys. Thank you very, very much. And you have I, a question. I, I just have a question for, for Brian. I remember, it might be apocryphal, wasn't there a famous Sky at Night programme where there was an argument about whether it was zodiacal light or zodiacal light? And someone told me, I think Chris told me, it went on for about <laughs> ten minutes in the memory. <laughs> yeah, not, nothing to do with me. I think, I think it's the difference between potato and potato, or whatever, tomato and tomato. Yeah. You know, well, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know what the answer is. Potato. It's not... No one says potato. <laughs> I, I, no one <laughs> where do you come from? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, let's, trust me, I'm, I'm very definite about potatoes. Yeah. Uh, and not, no one ever says potato. Isn't it a song? <laughs> is it a song you say I, I, potato? Tomato, like tomato, it. yes. Yeah. That is a genuine debate, yeah. but potato, no. Cold potato. <laughs> yeah. Now, a number, so many questions. We're going to move on to manned missions, just briefly, because we have a question from Chris Coley asking, why should we send men to Mars, or should we just concentrate on sending rovers? Matthew Fleming, if we decide to send people to Mars, will it be a one-way ticket? That's a major question, obviously. Yeah. So what do you all think about that? Well, I think we, we should be sending humans to Mars, and in fact, all the major space agencies around the world are working towards this. But um, I think at the moment, with the approach, looking at getting rovers there, intelligent rovers and making use of those that that's the way to go and then in the background do the research how can you get humans keep there keep the humans alive keep the, the humans there. alive <laughs> keep them sane and but definitely i think you should bring them back so what's the, the journey time at the moment what, what uh, with current six to eight months with, with rocket technology we're sending the probes and you can't come back you couldn't you, you couldn't you, get you go to mars and then you have to wait for the orbits to come around again then you get to come back so you can't throw on the handbrake and how long but the amount of fuel required to do the amount of fuel required to go there carry that fuel with you and then come back exactly. again that's the argument for one-way mission mm. yeah it's not a suicide mission so what you go and don't expect to come back you live your life there stuff. Yeah. How, sorry, how is you that live not like a suicide mission you go because we're going to die right come back but you choose to die on mars on the day on earth you live your life on a planet yeah and listen i'm not saying they wouldn't have appealed to people but the the other one which is which is the other danger of course is that because of cosmic radiation uh, you'll go blind. You'll go blind. And crazy. It's crazy in your brain. Cos cos cosmic radiation is, it, it affects, uh, because it gets bounced away by the, by the magnetic field, I presume, we yeah, have it gets here. Yeah. It gets deflected away. Field. But all astronauts see, they see streaks passing before their eyes, because the soft tissue in their eyes mm. it, it reacts very strongly with it. And there's a greater chance of getting cataracts. Uh, and generally, you'd get to Mars. But that, no one spent that long no. in space no. uh, to find out what the actual effect of, of either getting cancer or getting cataracts. What's the longest, actually? What's the longest? Similar? Just over a year on the space station. Uh, a yeah. Russian yeah. cosmonaut. I think one interesting thing about us, I watched the documentary that was on uh, BBC Two, I think, about uh, Neil Armstrong the other day, and I think there's a sort of cultural issue as well, which is when I was a kid, when I was about seven, if you asked a boy what he wanted to be, he would say astronaut as his first thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that because now we don't really have that many manned missions, the concept of the astronaut as a kind of oh, modern yeah. superhero has slightly gone. So I think we should be sending manned or womaned missions to these places just to recreate that. Yeah. The iconic, heroic figure. Creation is what you're yeah. asking for here, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, well, maybe that's <laughs> a bit more than that, though. The idea of the superhero, the actual superhero. Because yes. yeah. Curiosity, I mean, he looks nice. That isn't Curiosity. But he yeah. looks essentially like a Christmas present, I think. <laughs> uh, she does. I think that's not like having a, a human being that no. you can look up no. to, like Buzz Lightyear, who I know is not a human being either. But you no. know what I mean? Well, so it was a great motivating factor, wasn't it? I mean, I, I was born in 68. I just caught the, the very tail end of Apollo. The first thing I remember is Apollo saw you in 75 yeah. but you you would remember Apollo I mean was that one of the one is that one of the great motivating factors for you it was well it was a lot earlier than that for me I'm afraid to tell you because I remember the the Sputnik 1 1957 was, the, was Sputnik 1 and that's right. the reason that we're here today really because yes. that that's the fact that Bernard Lovell was able to track it gave him the government funding that he needed a nice bit of sleight of hand really because it made us look like we were part of the space race yeah, yeah. Mm. So I remember it all, yeah, and the first moon landings. It seems like yesterday to me, but of course it's ancient history, isn't it? Men, men landing on the moon. Yes. But those yeah. men, you really are in Neil Armstrong or whatever. They were heroes. Yeah, they were. True, yeah, yeah. they yeah. really were. But it may be just simply that it's mm. too dangerous, it's ridiculously, like, uh, you know, it's, it is a one-way ticket. It's difficult to be a hero on a one-way ticket. Would you go? Mm. I no, would go. I would. I may go at a stage, I wouldn't go now. You know, young family, I wouldn't go now. And, no, and the thing is, people, when you were 70, you'd be too old. No, but that's the only thing. Would you go when you're a young family? Probably not. I mean, this is a plan that you'd send older well, people you, who have already like, had children. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and yeah. people who could also withstand the psychological pressures of going as I well. Would so go, you'd have to select I, if people I, I would carefully. insist on taking only the complete works of Shakespeare and Megan Fox. I haven't read the complete works of Megan Fox. Oh, very kind of <laughs> 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 need much of the journey to cover them. Uh, okay, we have a new member of our team here on Back to Earth, uh, an interstellar icon who's travelled through space and time, and now he's our brand new quiz master. F so, for a question, over to Canines Question Time. <laughs> Master Dara, I am K9.
I have with me an ordinary jar of salted peanuts. I wish to know what role did peanuts like these play in the launch of the Mars rover Curiosity? Answer well, Master. So, what role did peanuts, salted peanuts play in the... But I couldn't hear the question, because that was the music to Rugby Special, wasn't it? No, it was yeah. K9's music. K9 had his own show, and I think that was his theme music. Yeah. But I thought it was Rugby... Yeah, yeah. Rugby? I recognise that. It was Rugby Special, apparently. It was the Rugby Special music, yeah. So, yeah I, I've just been told... Oh, was, I, I, was, I, I, was it? Yeah, it was. No, no, I watched that. And that distracted you so sufficiently, you didn't bother listening to yeah, it? Yeah, so I had no idea what was was it was. Anyway, I heard it. It was why... Salted peanuts. Salted peanuts, what have they got to do with curiosity? Yes, exactly. What's their importance for the curiosity? Is it a question from K9 or KP? That's what I want to know. Very definitely. Uh, bravo. Thank uh, you very much. Do you know, yeah. I don't know the answer. No. Anyway. I don't know. Curiosity likes Snickers. I don't. I have no idea. No, it's nothing to do with that. I don't know. I have no idea. It is. Uh, well, the only way to find out is to ask K9 himself. Hello, K9. Here is the answer, Master Dara. Salted peanuts were eaten by the team in JPL Mission Control during the launch of the Mars rover Curiosity as part of a strange superstition they have honoured since 1964. They believe if they don't, the mission will end in disaster. Illogical, but it is true. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's K9. Nice. It's sweet, isn't it? Like K9 nice. is literally the only 1970s BBC television star that you can safely book onto a show these days. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What? 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 <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> the, the point is that in NASA they always have they have salted peanuts on the, on, on the benches in in the uh, in the launch centre. We have a still actually over there. They and they they print their own labels for them and they have them up. It's one of the it's a surprisingly superstitious world. Uh, the world of space travel. The, uh, uh, the lucky boxer shorts. The lucky there are lucky boxer shorts. There's there's a tie cutting ceremony at the start before you, before each launch. Russian and um, cosmonauts before they go up on every ship they have a beautiful superstition where they get off the bus that leads them to the launch thing and then they walk to the back of the bus and urinate on the tyre of the bus. <laughs> <laughs> and this actually, male or female cosmonauts do this. Uh, and I don't, uh, the, I don't understand how the spacesuit allows them to do that. Uh, that's an excellent question actually, uh, just yeah. surprisingly accessible. It's presumably one with a fly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't that sort of compromise the integrity the, the, the of the internal... vacuum seal? And... Yeah. It, it probably does, yes. <laughs> it's so... a wind-up. Yeah. <laughs> I think it might be a wind-up for that reason. Wind -up. Now, oh, some it's excellent fast. questions have come, by the way. On Twitter, David A, which is not the most identified name in the world, if there was life on Mars, why haven't we found fossils? in cliffs like you would find them here? Well, we haven't looked in very many places yet. You know, it's a big planet. The, the total um, coverage of Mars, the, the landmass, is about the same as the landmass on the Earth. So that is a huge area to search, and it depends where you land. Bacterial fossils are very small as well. So some of the earliest signs of life on Earth are, are bacterial fossils, from strands of bacteria stuck together. Yeah, and, they do and that's that. exactly what we're looking for on Mars with, with microscopes on the rovers. And they're, what, 3.8 billion years old? Mm. Controversial. Well, it, it is quite billion. contentious, but around that area. But by about 3.5 million years ago, the evidence is good, but earlier than that, in the kind of dawns of time, it gets a bit risky. I remember reading that th there was some controversy a while ago about the possibility of these microfossils in meteorites. I know that that's relatively discredited now, but there was... Well, the Allen Hills meteorite, yeah, from, from Mars. Yeah. There were several lines of evidence that all sutted, uh, all kind of being the jigsaw puzzle, different pieces building up to the story of there being light inside that meteorite. But mm. the community's kind of stepped back a bit from that assertion now, because mm. the, the evidence taken as a whole isn't good enough. Mm -hmm. But th there's some really good um, uh, research coming from a meteorite that was found recently from Mars that shows water, the presence of water in there, and a lot more than in previous yeah. Mars samples. Mm. And the meteorite dates from about 2,000 million years ago, so it's another piece of that puzzle looking at what the conditions were like on Mars. Samples from Mars that happened to go there to get yeah. the Mars. And there, was there methane uh, detected on Mars? There is very, very tiny amounts of methane, but I'm not sure it's, what that okay. means. <laughs> Turns out science is quite controversial. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> Some scientists say that they can find it in their data, others say they can't. It's right on the limb. Um, Producing the methane? So, that, I mean, that's the question. No, virtually all of the methane in our own atmosphere that we're breathing right now in the air is basically fast out by bacteria. It's biological methane. Yeah. Um, so, if you find methane on Mars, it could also be biological or it could be geological, it'd be kind of a, you know, a dead rock process. But we see no other signs for current geological activity. That produce methane like we're that, get, so. We're getting a lot of emails, by the way, about contamination. How do we know that we are, aren't going to discover our own footprints, as it were? Mm. We haven't mm. sent over microbes. Mm. They, uh, yeah. uh, 
It's something that you have to take into account. Yeah. So the, the labs that we work in, when you see the guys putting together their instruments, then they are suited up. They've got gloves. You can't it's smoke like a beforehand. Theater, yeah. That's right. And, and the legacy from studying the Antarctic as well, that we can't contam contaminate areas of our own planet, mm. means that we're using that now on Mars. But it, it is a really serious question. But also, we don't want to contaminate back the other way. We don't want to bring anything back from Mars, potentially in the future, that will then have an adverse but effect and contaminate there are, here. There are plans for sample return missions, though, aren't there? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's the next big step. Mm. I was wondering when you were talking about putting things on the outside of spaceships, I was sort of getting alarm bells then, because if they survive, then you've really... You're, you're, you're polluting somewhere, aren't you? Wherever it, it could lands. Be. You could be, but hopefully then you're bringing everything back to the mm. surface of the Earth, because um, at the mm. moment that would just be up on the space station. Well, was it mm. Galileo that was... Um, it was around Europa, uh, but the around fear was once they were... Was it Europa? Jupiter, it was in orbit around Jupiter. Jupiter yeah, but it was, it was, they didn't want to crash it onto yeah. uh, Europa, so they crashed it onto Jupiter instead because Europa is a very good chance for life, so we're not going to contaminate yeah. it with... So we're, we're aware of this yeah. already, yeah. yeah. The, uh, what, would, it, would it change something for you if, it was, if, the, you know, if you found there was definitely proof of life on Mars? Would it, would would it change my life? Well, no, would, you, would, would it be exciting to you? Would it be exciting or disappointing no. if it was a tiny micro? Yeah, it would be a bit disappointing if it was a tiny micro, because I, I think what would happen is there would be a lot of fuss about it and, and scientists would go crazy about it and the rest of us would just think, not a little green man. That's what we were after. We were after a little green man, or we were after some kind of version of K9, this and is, it's yeah. a micro. It's a deeper question, though, isn't there? Which, if it really was, if it showed that there was a separate origin of life, mm. Mm. so life had begun mm. somewhere else, that, that has real deep mm. implications, doesn't it? Mm. I mean, it's... But what would be the, cur the narrative of that? Because then the life would have died when Mars died, or, you know, how, what would it tell us about our own narrative? That's well, it would, tell us, it would tell us that we are not the only place in the universe yeah. where life began. Can I get you to have a look at that? See what you think that is? And that's more interesting than the question of how we learn. <laughs> 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 you think we all come back to the one show again? No, it's not. It works. Don't tie it up. Don't tie it up. Don't tie it up. Oh, sorry. It's a. It's a. It's like a piece of wire. It's a big piece of wire. Do you know what it does? This is very important in terms of in terms of how we send uh, rovers up in the future. Does it bend in certain ways or is it, no? Is it, is it the shape? wire that they attach the parachute of rover to? No, it's not actually. No, it's more interesting than that. Even. Is it an interesting material? Yes, it is an interesting material. Yes. Is oh, it we're carbon warm, based? No, I, I'll, I'll I've seen a kettle. Please I know there's a kettle. Please, there's, 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 there's a kettle here. I know the tension is enormous, and I really do build it well, yeah. like, a, like an expert game show host. We put very hot water, and you could also excite it by using uh, by running an electric current through it. That'll that'll heat it as well. But when you heat it. Uh, you do actually, yeah, and hopefully it should spring back into shape. Oh. The, uh, it's a memory metal. Uh, the, uh, and what it does is, once you run a charge to it or put it into boiling water, it returns to a shape, whatever shape you previously gave it. Now we gave it the shape oh, of a star. star. Uh, right. 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 There. Is that clear enough there? Can you see that? And the idea is that there is, for example, one of, there is a Chilean proposal, part of the Lunar X uh, competition, that they will send up a rover in which the wheels are squashed down, basically. They, they create the shape of them first, they squash them, then they run a charge through them when they arrive up, and they'll pop out into a shape in which they can drive. And uh, now we are going to look at Mark's guide to what you can see in the sky tonight, providing the weather isn't as bad as it is here. Here's your stargazing star cast. Earlier in the show, we looked at the planet Jupiter, and if the sky is clear where you are after the programme, it's a great time to go out and view it yourself. It's the brightest object in the sky quite high up and due south, moving slowly west. Whilst you're looking south, you can also see the constellation of Orion to the lower left of Jupiter. Look for the distinctive line of three stars that form Orion's belt. Above and left of the belt is Betelgeuse, a red supergiant star which forms the top right corner of the Winter Triangle a triangular pattern formed from three bright stars best seen in the winter months. Each of these brilliant stars belongs to a different constellation. The lower star of the triangle is the brightest star in the entire night sky. Called Sirius, it's in the big dog constellation Canis Major. This constellation represents one of the dogs following Orion across the sky. Completing the winter triangle, the final star is at the top left. It's called Procyon and is the brightest star in the constellation of Canis Minor, the small dog. If you draw a line from Sirius up through the centre of the Winter Triangle, eventually you'll come to two similar brightness stars called Castor and Pollux. These are the brightest stars in the constellation of Gemini, the twins. They represent the mythological twin brothers of Helen of Troy, and according to legend, they accompanied Jason and the Argonauts on the voyage in search of the Golden Fleece. If you're an early riser, you have an opportunity to observe the moon and two planets rising in the southeast just before sunrise. The ring planet Saturn rises in the east-southeast just before 3am, 
but you'll get the best view of the planet just before dawn when it's higher in the sky. Then a thin crescent moon pops up above the southeast horizon about 6 a.m. Finally, the brilliant planet Venus makes an appearance above the southeast horizon in the brightening dawn skies from 7:30 a.m. Now, be aware that of course the sun rises in the southeast. Please don't ever look directly at the sun; it's not a good idea. Now, for more stuff to see in the night sky, Lucy has recorded some audio guides that you can download. It's just like having Lucy in your pocket and take with you when you're stargazing. And you can get them on our website, which is bbc.co.uk forward slash stargazing. And back to you, Dara. Thank you very, very much, Mark. Now, we briefly asked you, Brian, about uh, life on Mars, but it, would, it could possibly have a very tangible effect on you if it was discovered, thanks to the bet that you made here. I'd lose money. You'd lose a lot of money, actually. Mars is not too unlike the Earth, and I'm sure there is a certain amount of life on Mars. Tell you what, guys, I'll lay you odds of a million to one that they don't find it in, inside 50 years. Right. There's a pound. <laughs> would you still go a million to one? It would be expensive. Well, I want it to be proved wrong, you know. I would love it to happen, of course, but I have this feeling that maybe we are alone. It's possible. In spite of all the, the statistics, it is possible this is the only time this ever happened. Well, there is this, so the, we'd better get it right. The, the, the Fermi paradox, this famous uh, idea that if there were other civilizations out there in the Milky Way, mm -hmm. as we found now with those billions of Earth-like planets, mm -hmm. then where are they? Why haven't they visited Earth? Yeah. There's been plenty of time to yeah. cover those relatively short yeah. distances. Yeah, you'd like to be proved wrong, wouldn't you? As well? I, mean, I would I'm... love to be proved wrong. Yeah. I'll, I'll give you ten to one, though. <laughs> 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 done. Well done. Can I bring you back to the to the other man in that end of it? You were very close to Sir Patrick Moore, weren't you? We all love Patrick. Yeah, you couldn't help but love Patrick. He was such a giving person, and and really, you know, what he did for astronomy and for for young people's hopes is 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 incomparable. Yeah, we all miss him greatly. And you all presumably worked with him a great deal. Well, yeah. I mean, I. Um, I think I met um, Patrick. We both met on the 700th anniversary edition of the Sky yeah. at Night, didn't we? Yeah. And I think we both had the same observer's book of astronomy, if I remember rightly. It was from 1970 mm. something. I had it as a school prize, mm. and, and and it was one of the the things that you find a lot of astronomers, professional astronomers around, have books like that that mm. Patrick wrote. I, I have his 1968 book on the sun that I was reading again over Christmas, <laughs> which was yeah. really delightful to read, and it's it's pre mm. a lot of the activity that I now study, but. It's yeah. written so well, and I could hear him as I was reading the words. Hear him to say very distinctive them. delivery. Yeah. There's a light touch, doesn't he? I mean, mm. It just draws you in. Yes. Probably best in this to uh, give that final word on that to Sir Patrick himself. Will you please close one eye? We've just had superb news. Halley's Comet has been sighted for the first time in over 70 years. <laughs> it's coming out. Yes, there is the moon. I can see it for the moment. No, it's gone again. Is it worth keeping it there, do you think? There's nowhere else to point it, is no, it? No, I'm afraid not. Flaming things stuck. The pull is added, you see. Can we get high tides? The force of the tides is the biggest natural force in the entire world. And so, from Brighton, where the sky, sky is now completely overcast, good night. So, Patrick Moore, they're trying to look at stars despite an overcast sky. Thankfully, that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> uh, now, that is all for us on Back to Earth for tonight. Thanks to Dr. Brian May, David Badil, Dr. Lucy Green and Dr. Lewis Dartnell and all of our audience and stargazers here. Tomorrow, scale, this is quite epic, isn't it? The history and future of absolutely everything when we contemplate the origins and makeup of the entire universe. So we want your cosmology queries about the Big Bang, dark matter, dark energy, the life of stars and everything astrophysical. You're really looking forward to this one, aren't you? Go. Oh, you get I can't really wait for that. This kind of Good stuff. Don't forget to see if you're sending a photograph. We'll see you at 8 p.m. BBC 2 tomorrow for more of this. See you later.